Welcome to the Laser Channel, I'm Greg, and in this video I'm going to show you how to initially connect the Atomstack R3 Pro rotary attachment to the Atomstack A20 Pro 20 watt laser module using the popular Lightburn software. Stay tuned to find out how. Welcome back. To get started, let's cover the materials needed. Of course, we'll need a rotor unit, the laser machine, and the software that I'll be using is Lightburn. If you don't yet have Lightburn, they do offer a free 30-day trial version of the software that has all of the features in it. With that covered, here's the materials that we'll use. Starting out with, uh, this is an old uh, glass jam jar that I have. I highly recommend doing this initial setup with something that has straight sides on it. Next, we'll need some type of measuring device. I have a nice scale that has both inch and millimeter on it. It comes in very handy. Next up, we'll need some type of a masking agent to uh, put a coating or a covering on the glass so that it can accept the engraving. And for that, my personal favorite is black tempera paint. It's water-based and washes off very easily. Another popular method is using cold galvanizing compound spray paint. Uh, I have used this in the past on my projects. Um, it dries very quickly, it dries very evenly. However, I found I have to spray this outside because this stuff really smells. And then I'm also a little bit skeptical about lasering paint that has metallic particles in it. So use that as your, at your own risk and discretion. Uh, another option that people use is just regular old spray paint. And the last couple things are blue painter's tape. I'll show you what that's for in just a minute. And then some type of a cleaner to clean the glass, whether it's denatured alcohol or a Windex cleaner. And some paper towels that just ran away from me. And lastly, a level. And I'll show you where all of this is used in just a minute. We'll start out easy in step number one is just to simply place the rotary attachment inside of the work area of the laser machine. Now I've got the drive belts are going to be off to this side with the connector cable coming out on the opposite side. The cable side comes out on this side because as a part of this step we're going to detach this connector for this motor that controls this movement. This will now be stationary. With this connector removed, we're going to plug the rotary attachment into that connector. And the last part of step one is to square up the rotary attachment to the rest of the machine. And for that, I like to use a scrap piece of wood from a previous project. And I like to use the gantry frame for that. So I just use this flat board placed against the framework and I move that forward. And then I'll just do a visual check of moving that up against until it is just gently against the rollers on the one side. And one tip that I have for step one is this connection can be made with power off or with power on. Just make sure that the laser machine isn't actually running while this connection is being made. And step two, another simple step. I'm going to take my glass with the straight sides on it and just place it on top of the rotary unit, making sure that it has even contact with the rubber covered rollers from top to bottom. The other thing that I'm going to check is I'll check the level of the table and see that I'm reasonably level. I'll check the level of the top gantry crane to make sure that it matches the level of the table. And then lastly, I'm going to check that the glass is level. And the reason why I'm checking this is so that as the laser moves from the top side of the glass to the bottom side, I know that I'll be in perfect focus from top to bottom. Set the focus of the laser to the glass. And using the included fixture that comes with the laser machine, setting the focus is fast and easy. And the very last part of step number two is to position the Y axis here. For that, I'll show you an end view of what I'm looking at. 
So I'm just going to manually spot where I think the laser would fall as uh, 12 o'clock on the glass here. And that will ensure that it's in perfect focus and that we don't have any distortion. An extreme example of this being in the wrong position would be as if we're way off center over on this side. So I'll push this back to that 12 o'clock position. And that completes step number two. This really is fast and easy to initially to get this set up. And there's just a couple parts in step number three. Mainly we're going to clean the glass and put some type of a coating on the glass for the engraving process. I'll start by cleaning the glass. It needs to be cleaned free of fingerprints on both the outside and the inside of the glass. Any debris or fingerprints on the inside of the glass could accidentally create an engraving inclusion or engraving on the inside of the glass. And for that I'm going to use a denatured alcohol and a paper towel. And just a little bit is needed for this step. I like to start out by cleaning the inside that way I can really dig down inside the glass and make sure that all the residue and fingerprints have been removed. Then once I have the inside clean, I'll just grab the glass by the top and the bottom and clean the sides. And everything is nice and squeaky clean. Now because this is an initial setup on here and I don't have an unlimited supply of these jam jars, I'm going to use blue painter's tape to put over the top and I'll actually be engraving just the tape. That way I can test and adjust and retest as many times as needed and not actually be engraving this and go through these jars. And for placing the tape on here, initially what I'm going to start out with for a target engraving is I'm going to engrave a 30 millimeter by 30 millimeter uh, square on the glass. And I'm going to do that to make sure that once we engrave that onto the tape that we'll actually go back and measure that 30 by 30 square to make sure that all the measurements turned out as expected. Now if we've had our machine set up we could go ahead and apply the temper paint and we'll do that later on in the video but for this initial setup this blue painters tape works perfect. Step four is in light burn. I'll start by selecting my machine, which is the A20 Pro. And I'm going to draw that 30 by 30 millimeter box. I'll come up here and leave that unchecked. And I'm just going to manually type in 30 millimeters by 30 millimeters and enter. Let me grab my cursor and I'm going to move this box up to this position. And I'm going to move the job origin to uh, the nine o'clock position. That's typically where I have the top or the mouth of the glass. And this puts it in the center of that mouth and it's a great starting point. We'll also note that the start from position is from current position. And my speed and power, I think the speed I can, uh, that'll be good. The power, I believe that I can drop that down to about 35%. Again, we're just going to be uh, marking just the blue painter's tape. So not a lot of power is needed for that. Under my cuts and layers, I'm going to change that from fill to just a line, one pass, and everything looks good. I'll power on my machine. And I'll navigate over to the console and see that it is now connected and everything is okay. I'll navigate back to cuts and layers. And on my dashboard, I don't have the rotary enable switch uh, showing up. To enable that, I'll navigate over to edit, move down to settings with this menu open over on this side here, show rotary enable on main window. I'll click that so it's a green on, okay. And now it shows that it's on. Now this is gonna be a little tip. We're gonna try this without enabling the rotary, even though the rotary is attached, but during this setup on the Atom Stack setup, 
we disconnect this motor and essentially replace it with the motor inside the rotary unit. Now the really neat thing that Adam Stack did is they essentially used the same spec motor from the machine inside the rotary attachment. And the relevance of that is that there shouldn't really be any settings that really need to change on here. The only thing that might throw somebody off a little bit is if the diameter of these drive rollers are a little bit different. So we'll start out with this method and I'll show you actually running it in rotary mode in just a minute. That placement looks good. I have it offset a little bit closer towards the top and that completes everything in step number four. And we're actually going to engrave this out uh, starting by hitting the frame button. And I see that that is not anything near what I expected it to be. And that is because I changed the XY position before instead of the width and the height of the box. Some of you watching closely from your computers at home caught on to that. So I'm going to retype the width and the height in the correct spot. And when I hit enter, now that is in the correct sizing. Let me zoom in on that a little bit more. So that does now look correct. Let me frame that one more time. And that does look good. I'm going to turn my air assist on at a low whisper of air. I just do that so that any smoke that comes up during the graving doesn't go up and hit my lens and prematurely dirty the lens up. And I get this air that the cut might be out of bounds continue anyways. I'm going to hit yes, but I leave this on as a reminder to make sure that I frame things out. Uh, I've been using lasers for uh, quite a while now and just when I think I've got everything set up perfectly and I don't need to do that, I find that I made a mistake just like I did earlier where I changed the XY position to 30 by 30 instead of the actual width and height of the object of the box. So everything does look good. Everything is in focus. I have everything aligned. Now click yes and the engraving will start. With that part complete, we did our first engraving. It's a test engraving and what we're going to do is measure the height of the box and that is perfect 30 millimeters and it should be because this direction of the gantry was calibrated from the factory and now that we're going to check the rotational dimension and for that I'm not going to hold the ruler up I'm actually going to rock the ruler across to see what the measurement is and I'm getting something that's off by less than one millimeter so for me I don't need to run my machine in the rotary setup. I'm gonna retape this and run the same test again, but only with the rotary enabled, and I'll show you some of the menus inside of that. With new tape applied, I'll gently place the glass back underneath. In Lightburn, I'm going to enable the rotary. And up on the top bar, I get this like a little circle in this green light popped up, stating that the rotary setup is now enabled. When I click on this icon, it brings up this other menu. And it will give us a choice between a chuck type or a roller type. We do have this roller type. We have the rotary enabled. Uh, we're not going to look at if we need to mirror the output just yet. We are on the Y axis. And the main thing that we would adjust if something was off is this roller diameter. And what I've found in the past is you can move this number, adjust that number a fair amount uh, before you start to see an, a change on the glass. But ours looked good, but I'm going to leave this all the same here as the default. Uh, this bottom section here is just for a calculation mainly if you had a chuck type uh, rotary unit. This looks good. I'm going to put my safety glasses on and again, I don't think that I need to do it, but I will frame this one more time.
And that did some really odd stuff, so it's good that we did frame that out, which means I need to go back into the rotary setup. So I changed the value from 17 millimeter roller diameter down to five, and that actually made it travel much further than it needed to. So I'm going to go the other direction, and I'm going to almost double that. I'll choose 30 millimeter uh, on this. This I'm just using the trial and error method. I'll frame this one more time. And that looked better, but I'm still off by a fair amount. And we'll go 85. As I had mentioned, you can make some pretty large jumps in this number before you really see something. So that works out pretty well when you're trying to really fine tune uh, this initial setup. I think that's pretty close, so I'm going to run the program off of that. Start, and yes. And let me see what this looks like. And here's what we look like. We're definitely much wider than 30 millimeters. So I'll try 115 millimeter roller diameter. Let me frame that one more time. That looks pretty darn close right there. And let's run the laser this time. And let's take a measurement. You can see where the first one was. Here's the second one. It's looking a lot more square. And we'll get that up in the focus zone. And we'll see that that is 30 millimeters. After recording the entire video, I realized that there's one thing that I left out that's really important. And this is a step that is after drawing the 30 by 30 box in the software to make sure that we get a 30 by 30 box in the machine, is I wanted to draw the number two in the software and make sure that it shows up in the correct orientation in the machine. And by that, I mean that that image does not need to be mirrored. So I grabbed my jam jar again and I placed two pieces of this blue painter's tape again. The first test I'm going to use, I'm not going to have the rotary enabled in the software, just like when we drew that first box. And the second piece of tape, I'm going to enable the rotary accessory and see if both images come out in the proper orientation. Let's jump into Lightburn and check that out. Clicking on the text tool, I'm going to write the number two. And I'm going to check the size of this and the height at 33 millimeters looks good. That'll be large enough. And I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees again, shift holding down that shift button, we'll move that object in 15 degree increments. And again, the start from is the current position. I'm going to change my layer from fill to line. When I check the preview, I'll show that this is going to take just a couple of seconds to do this. Before I start, I like to frame out the object, make sure that everything is covered on that mask tape area, and that looks good. I'm ready to start. And for the first test, with the uh, rotary disabled in the software, the two comes out in the proper orientation, and I do not need to rotate the image. I'll place this back under for our test number two. And this is something that you won't need to do every time you do your machine. This is just learning how your machine reacts with your particular setup. So for test number two, everything can stay the same with the exception of I'm going to enable the rotary. Again, I'll frame that out one more time to make sure everything looks good. And that looks correct. And I'll hit start. And again, this one, I wouldn't expect it to mirror it, but it's always nice to double check. So on my machine with my setup that I have, I do not need to mirror the image and everything looks correct.
Now the reason why I'm showing the setup of the rotary unit is some of you might have a different attachment that you have on here. Maybe you're referencing this video even though you don't have this particular model of laser machine, but there's still some relevance of it. So I did want to show that setup in Lightburn on how to adjust the drive distance of your rotary accessory to get that distance to match up on your glassware. I'm going to remove this tape, clean the glass, and I'll show you how I apply my masking agent or paint onto this glass. There's lots of different ways to do this. And the right way is the way that works for you. So the version that you see me using might not be the best for you, but it works for me and maybe it'll work for you. So I'm now in a different part of my garage where I'm going to uh, clean the glass uh, one more time just because I handled it a whole bunch of times before. So again, that denatured alcohol, starting by cleaning the inside of the glass and then just handling the top and the bottom of the glass. And for this first test engraving, I'm going to use that black tempera paint. And normally what I use is an airbrush. I mix the paint down, uh, maybe uh, one part of water to three parts paint. It all depends on what brand of paint you have, uh, the type of airbrush you have, and the air pressure that you run at. But I do realize that not everybody has access or they want to invest in an airbrush and an air compressor. So I'm going to try this other method that I saw uh, another person try out and that was they just simply roll dipped their glass in the paint. It looked kind of sloppy and everything but uh, they did a whole batch of them and uh, they showed me the results and it looked actually really good. Now what I like to do on my glasses though and all the methods is I have the space heater and I turn that on and I like to preheat the glass just a little bit but not to the point where it touches the, the colder paint and it shatters the glass. So it should always just be kind of warm to the touch, uh, especially with tempera paint, it helps it dry a bit faster. Take another paper towel and I'm just going to spread some of this uh, paint out. And the neat thing about this is if anything gets marked up a little bit, I've got my nice favorite flannel on is, again, it's temper paint. Uh, it's easy and quick water cleanup. There's absolutely no fumes coming off of this. So let me just try rolling that across. I'm using this paper towel as kind of like a paint brush to kind of put uh, somewhat of an even coat on. That's kind of what we're looking for is an even coat of paint across the jar. Let me place that in front of the heater and let that cure. And while that first coat is drying, if I was using an airbrush, I'd put the first coat on where you could barely see any of the paint on the glass. I'd put it back in front of the heater and let that dry. And I'd repeat that process. The, the second coat of paint I could put on a little bit more. What I'm trying to avoid is any uh, runs or drips uh, running down the glass. Uh, I usually do about three to four coats with coat three and four being a bit heavier. And again, just want to block most of the light out and the name of the game is to have an even coat of paint across the glass. And here's the second coat that I put on. I took the paper towel out and put some more paint down and just ran that across through here and got some pretty good even results from that. I'm going to put that up in front of the heater and let that dry. And while this jar is drying, I was able to find one more empty jam jar. So I think on this one, because it is nice outside, uh, while I'm recording this, I'm going to use the cold galvanizing compound spray paint because I can have some doors and windows open. So I'm going to clean this jar up and then Here's my fancy spray booth as a recycled Amazon box. And just as before, I'm going to clean the inside of the jar, get all my fingerprints on the outside of the jar. With all of that out of my system, I'll wipe down the outside of the jar, handling the jar just by the top and the bottom. And this goes the same for any glassware that we'd have. Get this out of the way and just a couple light passes. Thank you. 
and that first coat has already dried. That is the advantage of the cold galvanizing compound is it does dry extremely fast. And for the second coat, I'm going to unplug the heater. For the cold galvanizing, only needed two light coats. And for the temper paint with the, uh, the heavy rolling action on this paper plate, I only needed two coats on that. And my method for that, I'll demonstrate with this cap, was I didn't spin the glass in place. Instead, I rolled the glass through the paint and I have this little uh, paper towel off to the side to redistribute the paint back over the paper plate. And then for the second coat, again, I just rolled that right across. And this is the effect that I got. Just a few more minutes at the space heater and we'll be ready to go back over by the laser machine and actually engrave a design. Now before I place the glass onto the rotary attachment, I like to take a look around on where the masking agent starts and where it ends. And I like to place a finger on both sides of those and I kind of take a look at what part looks like it's roughly in the middle. And when I find that point, I like to scratch a little bit of that masking agent off. And with that mark, that's what I like to put at the 12 o'clock position underneath the laser. That way I know that if I forget to frame out my work underneath the laser, I know that I'm centered up where all of the masking agent is located on the glass. And I can do the same thing on this cold galvanizing. As I can see here it starts, here the masking agent ends, and when I take a look at the end of the glass, I can see right here is about the middle of that, and I can put a little mark on there. And so when I place this one underneath, that's where 12 o'clock or the upright position will be. And I've imported this picture of a dog paw, and right now it's very large. It's uh, 290 something millimeters by 290 something millimeters. I'm going to make sure that the padlock is closed and I want to make this uh, 35 millimeters square. So when I hit enter, it's going to change both of those dimensions equally. And this looks good. I'm going to grab the corner and start rotating this. And I'm going to press and hold the shift key and turn it in 15 degree increments until it's perfectly turned 90 degrees. And I turned the top from a 12 o'clock to the nine o'clock position so that it matches that the top of our jar is facing the nine o'clock position. That way, if you see uh, other YouTubers and they're rotating their artwork while they're using a rotary, that's why they're doing it, so that the top of the jar is the top of the image. Let me frame this out to make sure that we're completely on the jar and that all of the engraving will fit over uh, the masking agent that we just applied. That looks good. I'm going to change the speed to uh, 85 and the power to 65%. Um, these aren't optimized, but I know that those settings will leave engraving on the jar. I have everything positioned properly and I'm ready to start the engraving. been about 10 minutes and the engraving is complete. I'm going to zoom out and let me power down the machine so I don't have to talk over the fan and here's the completed engraving and I've got a bucket of water that's probably just off camera. There's the completed engraving. It looks pretty good. I can see that there's a little texture in it due to uh, how thick I put the paint on. That's why it's so important to put nice even coats of that masking agent on. But I think on this dog paw, it actually works to the advantage of having a little bit of texture uh, in that paint and the varying thickness and it shows up in the engraving. There we go. So I like the way that that looks actually with that texture that's on the glass. So next thing that I'll try is putting this cold galvanized coated 
uh, jam jar underneath the laser engraver and we'll go and engrave the same thing again. So straight out of the machine, this is what that looks like. And the engraving still turned out black and as you can see off to the side here, it starts going into uh, a slightly different color. That's because the paint is starting to get a little thin on here, which reiterates the point why I like to have this mark up at the top to mark where the paint is going to be the most consistent. But again, I bumped the machine and uh, interrupted the communications or the power, so I had to restart the test again. So let's wash this off and see what the actual engraving looks like. The cold galvanizing compound did clean up very quickly with uh, a few wipes of the acetone. Um, it does clean up pretty easily, but again, I just prefer not to use those harsh chemicals. The engraving is complete on both of these test glass jars that I had. The first one being with temper paint. And I put the temper paint on very quickly. It went on pretty chunky. There's kind of a texture to that paint. And I know that that texture would come through on the engraving, but just wanted to show you viewers what that looks like and the importance of having a clean, even coat of this masking agent on the glass. And just like this paw print where some texture actually does add some detail to it and I think it makes it look better. And again, that's something that you can incorporate into your designs as well. And as a bonus, I did do a test jar with the cold galvanizing compound uh, on here. And because the settings I had were a little bit more powerful than what you'd normally run, it turned out like this black gray color, but sometimes there are people that are looking for an engraving that is actually going to be a dark color or even black. And that's one of the things that cold galvanizing compound can give you is a darker engraving. If you reduce the power or increase the speed, you can get that engraving to look just like this tempera paint. But again, if out of the two methods, even though the temper paint takes a little bit more time to apply, I do prefer to use that. There's no fumes to it. There's no fumes while it's being engraved and it cleans up with just regular water, whether it's warm water or cold water. The cold galvanizing compound spray paint, while it does go on very even and it dries very quickly, it does have a lot of fumes while it's drying, while you're spraying, and then even while it's in the laser machine, some fumes will come off, just like you saw in the video where I took some time out to hook up the exhaust fan that I had where I accidentally bumped the power connection going to the computer and to the machine, which is why, again, there's that double mark off to the side. So some really neat things with using just some glass jars or just extra glass that you might have around your household, you're able to do the initial setup and calibration of your rotary unit and the machine to make sure that what shows up in your software screen matches in the machine. And it's also a great way just to practice and to see what some initial settings with your particular setup will look like. And speaking of settings, many of you will probably ask down in the comments below of what specific settings work best with what glass and not all glass is really created the same. If you practice on uh, these jam jars versus like a, a beer or wine bottle, those are different grades of glass. They're cast differently, they're cast at different temperatures, and they accept the engraving differently than say uh, a crystal glass or fine wine glass or even just the common pint glass. But this will get you in the ballpark for a great start. This was a fun little video to make to show you viewers how to connect the rotary attachment to the machine and settings in Lightburn to configure and calibrate to make sure that the images in that software match up what is sent out to the machine, mainly that 30 by 30 square that we drew in the software. Along the way, I had some tips like using the blue masking tape at low power settings to see what the image looks like and the placement on your glass. If you found this video useful, please like, subscribe to the channel, or leave a comment down below. Doing any number of those things really helps this channel grow and it connects great content like this with viewers like you. 
And until next time, remember to learn, create, and share.